Hello. In this lecture, we'll be looking at realism in Europe and America and focusing on painting, sculpture, architecture, and photography from the middle to late 1800s. Now, realism with a capital R is a movement that at its core tries to combine the, a more scientific, analytical, and empirical approach to what realism, with a lowercase r, as a style, as a as a uh, identity of art, what it really means, uh, and it's looking at the realistic in terms of trying to depict and capture everyday life instead of an art that sees realism as a as an expression of form or simply as connecting to representing the natural, it tries to focus on those elements that make us real, who we are in the moment. The realist artist referred to this as the now. They didn't want to try and make art that looked back or looked too far forward. They wanted to try and make art that reflected who the people in life and culture and society were right at that moment. Now, realism focuses mostly in France and in America, and we're going to look at uh, those two groups separately as it relates to each of these media. Now, the leader of the realistic movement in France was a man by the name of Gustave Courbet. Courbet is an artist who wanted to choose subjects for his paintings, not based upon who they were in terms of their identity, but who they were in terms of their place in society, their role, their actions. This type of painting is referred to as genre painting because we see the figures, we see what they're doing, we understand who they are, but we don't see them in terms of being individuals. We don't see, that, see these works as portraits. But one of the things that Courbet was uh, a master at was trying getting the details of an image to tell the story. So in his one of his most iconic works here, the Stonebreakers, he shows us every uh, tear in the clothing. He shows us the dirt. He shows us the the harsh, difficult nature of their work, and we understand their lives not based upon who they are as individuals or what their names are or you know, what their personalities are, but on what their life is like based upon what they do every day. Now, in their time, Stonebreakers played a very important but maybe not all that celebrated or championed role. Most roads had been dirt, but the idea was to take rock and stone and break it into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces to create gravel. And we're familiar with gravel. It's a, a you know very important um, part, not only of road making, but of concrete and cement. Uh, it's an, um, um, the part of the fabric of our building and our day-to-day -day lives. But it wasn't something that was important. This task was done by the poorest, the lowest members of society. And you can just imagine their lives. They go out early, they take their lunch in the, the pot in the background with them, and they spend most of their day in this hot, dusty, very labor-intensive work. And that's why their clothes are torn and ragged, because these are not the elite of society, and yet they're still important. And that's what realism tries to focus on, is what's really important and what's the truth. You know, art for a long time, maybe for, from the very beginning, has tried to reflect man's truth, nature's truth, to not just tell stories or to create images that don't have any real personal meaning or don't have any connection to reality as we know it, as we live it. But what's the true story and nature of man? And I think that realism tried to get at that. And it got at it by observing. You know, one of the things that the realists learned from science is that how you figure out what something is, where it comes from, is by observing it, watching it, paying close attention to 
the truth of the details. So here we have a community funeral. And what's interesting about this is that not just that Corbet captures the scene, but how he depicts these figures. They stand around at the funeral and they don't seem to kind of put on the typical display that one would expect at a funeral scene. They seem bored. They seem you know, annoyed. They seem more interested in each other and in themselves and in, you know, than they do with the scene that's actually happening. Only those who are personally, personally connected to the deceased seem that they be in mourning. Everyone else seems to be looking at everyone else. And I think that that's one of the things that realism does, is that it shows us not the picture that we want the world to see, but the reality of what it's really like, of what man is really like. Now, realist artists tended to focus on people who were perhaps overlooked in previous generations of art and culture. The breakers, the, the mourners, the bed breakers, uh, or bread bakers. You know, I think that it's important that those overlooked that they could be just as important, that they could be just as meaningful. This is by Jean-Francois Millet. Now, Millet loved to focus on these, the absolute lowest members of society. You know, the baker who gets up early and works with just the simplest of materials, an oven, flour, water, yeast, you know, not not a complicated process, but absolutely essential to life and one that we just take so, so much for granted. And I think that for him, the, the metaphor of the worker was so important and the metaphor of those willing to do the work, very often women, but the willing to do the work that was just absolutely taken for granted by almost all of the rest of society. So we see the, the dark, the detail, the dinge, the dirt, all those things that make this life perhaps not one that, one that she would choose, but one that she has no choice but to do. Now, this is Malay's The Gleaners, and here we have the women gleaning the field. They, they come in after the pickers. They spend all day hunched over, bent over, picking up what the pickers have, the, the kernels the, that the pickers have dropped. And this is not only a, a, a very labor-intensive task, but it's also an act of charity. These are not necessarily workers very often, gleaners were women who had no one else to provide for them, which unfortunately was a, a common theme in the eight, uh, 19th century. Women were very often abandoned either from war or from just uh, their husbands are dying or just taking off and leaving them destitute and alone. And so the overseer, the manager, has allowed them to come into the field after the pickers and collect what they can. Now, it's not a life that one would choose. And I think that the, what the realists tend to focus on is that whether it's the top part of society or the lowest part, that life is lived and and the, the, the struggle to just survive very often can seem overwhelming. Now, as a, as a style, realism uses some of the lights and darks and modeling and techniques of realism with a lowercase r. But it's not about how realistic in the technical sense the work is. It's really much more about the message that one gets from viewing these works, that this is important, that these women are just as noble as the members of nobility or the wealthy or the elite or the church that had been the norm in terms of figurative subject matter for centuries. Now, each realist 
tended to put their own kind of spin on the technique. Henri Daumier that we see here was more of a draftsman. His works tended to focus on line versus value, although we do see it and kind of a suggestion of modeling, but it's high contrast, it's not blended, it's much more abstract than a true pure realist or Renaissance style painter would be. Daumier loved to see, to not only show these lower class figures, but to juxtapose them against the members of the upper class, to say that, you know, you couldn't be ignored this is called third class carriage, and he shows, you know, on a train, first class, second class, third class. Third class is the lowest class. It's it's for everyone. It, I mean, even the the wealthier who, if first class were full, who couldn't get on in that section of the train, they they might end up having to travel in the third class carriage. And so here we see all of humanity kind of pushed and mashed together. And that's one of the things that attracts Daumier is this, the universal nature of man and how we relate to each other. Now, um, one of the other elements of realism that I think is important is that not only were they looking to champion the overlooked or the lower class, but also I think it's important that they were using a more stylized approach. They weren't afraid to be slightly abstract. Now that's interesting because when we think about realism, we tend to think about matching the, the lights and darks, the shades and shadows and highlights of nature. But that's not at all what you get. You can see just how soft and abstract Daumier's figures are. And, and we'll see that that a spectrum, some realist artists tend to, folk, to work more realistically and some tended to work more abstractly. Now, um, Edvard Manet is one of those artists who sort of bridges the gap. He starts out a realist and then he also later in his, his life becomes associated with Impressionism. Uh, and, but at his core, I think he begins as a realist and sort of evolves into Impressionism. He, he never loses his abstract, or his uh, realism, lowercase r, in terms of his technique. This is one of his more iconic works. It's called the, called the Bar at the Follies Bergère, and it's an example of that race and class and, so, and social mixing that I was talking about. Here, the barmaid, who is surrounded by all of these wealthy, uh, upper-class individuals who are having a good time and celebrating, she seems completely ambivalent to what's happening. And on the right, what we see is actually the reflection. There's supposed to be a mirror behind her. And we see the reflection, and we see that there's this wealthy individual um, you know, who is engaging with her, and he's probably asking her for a drink, perhaps even based upon her reaction, uh, he might be propositioning her. And you can see that she's just complete, just stoic and ambivalent to his advances. She's surrounded by all this wealth and opulence, and yet doesn't seem happy at all. And I think that that's part of the message, is that wealth doesn't provide happiness. Now, in Manet's most important work and famous work called Luncheon on the Grass, this work was incredibly controversial in its time. And Manet actually, it, it, it very negatively affected his career when he put this work on display in the Paris Salon. What we see here are some young students, two men, two women. They've been having a picnic. Uh, you can see in the background a little uh, rowboat that they've been, you know, rowing uh, over to this kind of rem remote area near a river lake, and they've... Uh, been bathing the women in the afternoon after after eating have been bathing uh, to cool off and the the woman who's just been bathing here in the foreground has not bothered to clothe herself 
And she seems, she doesn't seem in any way uh, anxious about them viewing her nude body. And in fact, even us, she in directly engages the viewer. And that was scandalous. She was, you know, women were not supposed to be uh, so open with their bodies. And that was, um, that was partly what made this work just absolutely scandalous to the point where there were almost riots uh, and people calling for the work to be removed and even destroyed. But Manet, his whole point behind the image was to say that this is the reality of life, that we're not all so wrapped up in attitudes between relationships between men and women, that men and women could be equals, that men and, that women could be comfortable with their bodies, that it was not a sexual image necessarily, that it was just a part of life. Now, in America, realism takes on a slightly different meaning, especially in the build-up to and then in the aftermath of the Civil War. The realism has, so, has much more to do in, in, with the divide between classes because America at the time was a very divided class society. There were immigrants in one class. There were the the uh, the poor, obviously, the both rural and urban poor. There were the South, the difference between the South and the North. There were the differences between, you know, all of the different races, black and white and European descent and non-European descent, natives to America, people born here, even if they were of white descent, people who were born, they didn't trust immigrants. All of these kind of things being dealt with in American society that influenced these artists in their paintings. So here we see this woman, uh, obviously a widow, obviously grieving. Um, we don't know her story exactly, but we know what she represents. She represents, the in the aftermath of the Civil War, the, the widows. So many of those widows who um, are trying to have to make, reconcile, you know, the rest of their life, especially for young women. What to do now? How to survive now? And she just looks off into the distance and, as she sits at the window, um, you know. And we we feel her her questioning. We feel through the expression on her face, through the pose, through the composition. We feel her her trepidation at the future, and that really represented in thinking about the now, how America felt. America didn't know where it was going to go after the war. And Reconstruction was such a, an emotional experience for all of the country. Now, Winslow Homer, he, he really chose as his main subject this, uh, these, these feelings of, in, of recon reconstruction and reconciliation in the aftermath of the war. This is one, one of his more iconic works. It's called A Veteran in a New Field. And it's a double entendre. We have the veteran of war in a new field, as in a new occupation or returning to an old occupation. And then we also have a veteran, meaning someone of experience, in a new field, meaning he's opening the field. He's just beginning the process of cutting the, uh, the hay. Now... You know, the, the thing about it is, is that while it works on those elements of realism, we see, we recognize the figure, it is very abstract. It's very direct in the way that it's painted. It's very gestural. It's very textural. All of those elements that make um, his style unique to him. So it's not that Realism is in mimicking nature so much as it is realism is in capturing the moment of the now. Thomas Aikens has a completely different approach, whereas, you know, for uh, Homer, he's focusing more on kind of the, the rural life or perhaps the, the lower class life. Aikens is a, uh, a member of the society in the Northeast. And so he chooses as his image of the real in the aftermath, the buildup and aftermath of the war. It's you know, these, it's the war wasn't as real for these people. It wasn't fought in many cases in and around these places. And so society had gone on much like it had in the past. 
for the wealthy. So here we see these uh, you know, the wealthy elite in their carriage drawn by four horses out for this ride on this brilliant sunny day. And Aikens gets absolutely detail, every detail as accurate and marvelous as he can. And to him, that's the reality. This is the newest carriage. This is the newest thing. This is the newest element of how they, the wealthy and the and the noble of America were expressing themselves. Now, he also wanted to capture something of new approaches, more scientific approaches. So this is called gross anatomy. And here, this is a medical school, which was kind of a new thing at the time, the training of physicians and surgeons in a way that really focused on a more scientific approach to medicine versus a the, the previous approaches, which had been a little less scientific and a little bit more perhaps homeopathic or, uh, or you know, traditional. Now here we have the more experienced students being led by the, the professor, surrounded by, and this was the latest thing in education, surrounded by these tiered levels of students. And the farther, the closer to the, the ground floor you were, the more experienced and older and perhaps more qualified a student you were. So up in the top of the screen we see in the dark, the, the youngest, newest of the students who are just beginning to learn you know, their, their craft in medicine. Now, we haven't talked about too many female artists because there, ha there aren't that as many prevalent, but as we move be in further and further into the 19th and then the 20th century, we'll see more. This, this artist, Edmonia Lewis, is one of the most interesting and individualistic artist of her age. Not only is she a woman, so she's breaking that barrier in America at a time when women artists in America were very, very uncommon, but she's an African-American. She's a, She is the descendants of former slaves. She's working with that, uh, that slave experience. And so, you know, she calls this finally free. And she's a sculptor, which is really, really rare. There were a few women painters, but a, women's, a woman sculptor was incredibly rare, just all throughout history. So here we see the freed slave celebrating, blessing, praying, worshiping, finally the freedom, carved in marble. Never seen any subject matter like this before, but this is immediately the now. This is, this is the aftermath. This is reconstruction in the, the end of slavery. Lewis chooses most often as her subject matters people and figures that she's not used to seeing in Western art. You know, African Americans or pe members of different races or a, a different view on Egyptian art, perhaps. So here we have uh, Cleopatra, a, a figure who is famous in Egyptian history, but not so much in Western history. E Egyptology was becoming more and more popular in the 19th century, but from a Western perspective. And so here we have this uh, African-American woman who is enamored herself with Egyptology, and she brings that into her work. Now, as we move forward, what we're going to see is that architecture sort of veers away. Architecture had always been connected to art and culture very, very strongly, but it's during this period where architects go off kind of on their own course. Architecture is connected to its time, but and it's reflective of its time, as it always will be, but it doesn't necessarily have to feel tied to a movement. Movements are going to be focused more on media. So you'll see a movement in painting, and then a movement in sculpture, and they'll be happening simultaneously, but they'll be working with different uh, ideas or concepts. Architecture of the 19th century, the late 19th century, reflected, instead of the the realism and the gritty nature of man, it was really more fanciful. It was more grand, luxurious, and bringing things that were exotic into places that we're not used to seeing them. You know, this looks like an Indian building or perhaps an East European building, but it's not. It's This is the Royal Pavilion. This is English. It certainly doesn't look English. Although 
This is the time where English colonies and, and people of, from England are traveling around to all the colonies, including India, and bringing back with them those ideas of the exotic. So what we see is this very slightly romanticized view of Indian architecture, but brought into uh, you know, the, the contemporary um, English culture. So this is in a park in England, and it was this fanciful place. And that's really what marks architecture of the period, is this flights of fancy. Now, perhaps the grandest, most luxurious building built during this time period is the Paris Opera House, or Académie Nationale de Musique. It is incredibly grand and luxurious. It's almost impossible to overstate how rich and appointed and ornamented and just absolutely imaginably, unimaginably beautiful this structure is. It looks very Baroque. It's got Renaissance elements. It's got all kinds of sculpted details, very classical on the facade, on the exterior. When you get into the interior, you go through these grand halls and stairways, just overwhelming opulence, gold everywhere, frescoes, just incredible beauty. And then on the interior, when you get into the theater itself, just this overwhelming, these overwhelming boxes. And, you know, this reflects the, the time because the theater, opera, this is the, the age of the great, you know, Baroque musicians and the great writers of opera and these grand, amazing theatrical productions that were commonplace in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's the, this, this Paris Opera House is just the absolutely most beautiful and richest structure possible. Now, with the, in the 1840s, with the advent, the, the um, of the rise of photography, first as just a scientific process to figure out how to use light-sensitive chemicals, apply them to a plate, apply them to paper, apply them to glass or tin or whatever the, the surface of vehicle will be, how to expose them, how to create an image, how to focus the light. Every part of that had to be experimented and figured out and planned and done by hand, and, and each process was slightly different. We usually credit the beginnings of this with a man, to a man by the name of Charles Daguerre and his daguerreotypes. This is, de, this is considered the first photograph ever made. It's called In the Studio, and it is, of course, a still life because the exposure time, everything was experimental. The exposure time was very long, several, several minutes, and you can see this incredibly high contrast image, but very important because what it does, it establishes a way to create an image that recreates what we see without actually manipulating the materials by hand. The light, the camera, the chemicals, they do the, pro they, they do the work. All the artist does is focus the light. Now, as he ex they experimented more and more, the exposures got shorter and shorter and shorter, and that allowed for uh, more tonal variety. It allowed for capturing images, including images that incorporated figures, um, and what we see a view out of his window. This is some, this is one, some of the first when capture, using photography to capture the real world. And photography changed the world. It changed the world of art because no longer did the artist have to labor over capturing every detail perfectly. And now with photographs, a, a painter who's choosing to paint realistically in the sense of capturing those details has to be compared to a photograph. So how realistic is the painting? Well, we have the photograph to compare it to. Now, as the photographic process evolved and comes to America, artists like Timothy O'Sullivan, Matthew Brady, other photographers of the Civil War era, they're using it to document. So what we see are the first documentary photographs, photographing the battlefields right after the, the battle. 
seeing the dead, seeing not just a painting of the scene, but a, a, a very dramatic image that captures it in a way never possible before. These photographs could also document important and very, very special moments. You know, we are used to seeing art that commemorates or memorializes important scenes, important moments. But a photograph of the courthouse at Appomattox where Lee surrendered, I mean, this is in the moment. You can't get more in the now than a photograph taken of the scene as it's happening. And that's ultimately how photography is going to change art because artists are no longer going to be tied to these, these processes. And photography as an art is going to be using the techniques, the technical side of things, to do more and more to, re to uh, take away some of the roles that artists had played historically. All right, so that's a look at realism. And uh, be sure and watch all the other videos.